And uh, we have our next speaker, Lou Hawthorne from Nanotics. Um, you can join me on stage. Okay. Hello, everyone. My talk today is called Out with the Bad, Clearing Progeronic Soluble Factors with Nanots. Uh, I'm Lou Hawthorne. I'm the CEO of Nanotics and also the inventor of our core technology. So I want to start with some assumptions. We all have different assumptions. Uh, first, reducing age-related disease is good, regardless of impact on aging itself, because not dying of age-related disease is step one toward not dying at all. And the drivers between aging and age-related disease seem to overlap significantly. Two, the ideal anti-aging platforms also treat uh, FDA-recognized diseases, and the FDA gives rapid approval to treatments for fatal diseases, and safe treatments can be prescribed off-label. Um, Ushin, Unity, BioAge are all using this strategy. Three, senescent cells are immunogenic crap factories pr protected by immune inhibitors. And senescent cells, quote, drive aging phenotypes in pathologies. That's how Judy Campisi says crap factories. And the SASP includes powerful immune inhibitors. So depletion of those inhibitors is a potential new class of senolytics. Four, inflammation drives age-related diseases and may drive aging itself. Inflammatory cytokines are known to drive inflammaging, and their clearance is cenomorphic. Inflammatory diseases now include cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, even Alzheimer's. So not just the inflammatory canonical diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, etc. And five, targeting soluble pathogenic cell defenses is much safer than targeting cells directly. So Convoy's Law. No longevity presentation is complete without slides on parabiosis. And I like to call it parabiosis psychosis. The definition of psychosis is seeing things that aren't there. In the seminal 2005 study on um, heterochronic parabiosis, the authors weren't seeing things that weren't there. But a lot of the people that read this study uh, drew some of the wrong conclusions, particularly the idea of a fountain of youth. So let's just review that quickly. So in heterochronic parabiosis, the circulatory systems of an old and young mouse are connected together, and factors in the old parabiont flow into the younger parabiont, inducing an aging of the younger parabiont. And this is attributed to progeronic factors. It goes the other way as well, that in the younger parabiont, the blood flows into the older parabiont. There's a rejuvenation of the older parabiont, which was commonly attributed to anti-geronic factors, and that's where the controversy lies. This was dogma from 2005 to 2020. But then in 2020, the convoys came out with a series of new publications. I, I like to call the, their work at that point the dilution solution. What they showed is that tissues from all three germ layers can be rejuvenated by exchanging old blood, with pla old blood plasma with a mix of saline and albumin. Basically, they confirmed the first part of the heterochronic parabiosis hypothesis that progeronic factors are degrading the younger parabiont, but they basically disproved the second part. And that's because dilution with saline plus albumin led to almost all the benefits attributed to previously to young plasma. And so this leads to our group's main assumption, which is that organismal rejuvenation depends more on depletion of negative blood factors than addition of positive ones. And that tees up nicely with our technology, which is called nanots. These are, this is a new class of medicine. Nanots deplete pathogenic molecules from blood, but they don't engage normal cell surface proteins the way antibody drugs do. You can think of nanots as the world's smallest, most specific non-toxic sponges. And the way they work is there's a core, which is a structural element that's biodegradable and scalable. Onto that, we attach a capture agent. We can use any molecule with binding affinity for a target. Next, we attach a porous shield. This is a critical element. It covers the capture agent. It's porous to soluble targets that diffuse through and get captured by the agent, but it prevents any interaction with cell surfaces. It makes the nanot basically inert relative to cells. And finally, we attach a stealth coating just to delay immune recognition and clearance of the nanot until the capture process is complete. It ends up being 150 nanometers across, and you inject it like a drug, but it's cleared naturally by macrophage phagocytosis. These things are blazingly fast. They can deplete any soluble target they're programmed to deplete by greater than 95% in less than five minutes, and they can be programmed to suppress targets for minutes or up to just about 16 hours. 
So I want to zero in on a couple of targets that will really illuminate the unique capabilities of nanots, specifically TNF-alpha and STNFRs, which are soluble TNF receptors. And together, they drive dozens of serious diseases. So we think of these two as the signal power couple. So TNF starts uh, life as a, a, a membrane uh, cytokine. It's released in a paracrine, paracrine fashion. Its target is a cognate receptor on a cell, uh, and it, upon ligation, it'll induce apoptosis of that cell. But the receptor can be cleaved off by a shedase in, into a soluble form called an STNFR. At that point, it's a decoy slash inhibitor of TNF-alpha. Let's look at their roles in health and disease. In health, TNF-alpha kills bad cells, specifically the types in the upper left. In disease, TNF-alpha also kills cells. It just kills the wrong cells, leading to the pathologies in the lower left. Now, um, STNFRs neutralize TNF by binding to it before it can bind to a membrane TNF receptor on a cell surface. STNFRs in health defend good cells. Privileged tissue throughout the body employs STNFRs. So does the placenta and fetus. And it's also a general, it supports a general inflammatory sink. Now, in disease, um, STNFRs also defend cells. They just defend the wrong cells. All, sol sol all solid tumor cancers surround themselves with STNFRs as part of their immune evasion strategy. We think senescent cells do too. MRSA-infected cells do this. And STNFRs also drive the immune paralysis phase of sepsis. Now, TNF-alpha, uh, inhibitors of TNF-alpha are the largest drug class of all. Um, but it's an imperfect drug class because they hit both the soluble form of TNF, which is pathogenic, and the membrane form, which is essential for immune competence. STNFRs, on the other hand, are a completely undruggable target because an antibody against STNFRs would also bind the TNF receptor, which is essential for immune competence. So let's, let's look at inflammaging. So this is the uh, seven pillars diagram from Claudio Franceschi's work. He's the guy who coined the inflammation, uh, inflammaging phrase in 2000. And his seven pillars document is a little different than others because he puts inflammation right at the center of it. And he also states that inflammation and the other pillars are shared by aging and age-related disease. And the inflammatory cytokines he specifically highlights as driving inflammation inflammaging are TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta, and IL-6, all targets of nanot development. These are broadly pathogenic and poorly druggable. Let's dig into senescent cells and look at immune evasion as a particular issue. Senescent cells are um, histologically abnormal. They're covered with neoantigens, danger molecules, etc. They also secrete chemokines. And all of this raises the question, why does the immune system tolerate these cells? Why doesn't it destroy them as soon as they're formed? And if that question sounds familiar, it's because we've been asking the same thing about cancer for decades. And senescent cells are immunogenic. They do attract immune cells, which they then inhibit. Senescent cells secrete soluble TNF receptors. And everywhere in this diagram that you see that red halo, that means it's documented in the SASP. Incoming TNF-alpha delivered by immune cells gets neutralized by STNFRs. Senescent cells also release a broad range of other inhibitors which neutralize their cognate inflammatory cytokines delivered by immune cells. Senescent cells also have Mike A and B on their surface, which is a stress protein. That protein is detected by the NKG2D receptor on NK cells in particular. Senescent cells inhibit that mechanism by releasing the soluble form of Mike A and B to blind the NKG2D receptor. And that's the same trick that cancer uses. Immune cells have an inhibitory receptor, TGF-beta receptor. Senescent cells obligingly deliver TGF-beta to ligate uh, that receptor and inhibit immune cells. Immune cells also, of course, have the well-known PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor on their surface, and we know that soluble PD-L1 rises with age. It's not clear which cell types are producing it, but it's definitely creating an overall inhibited milieu. So taking it together, you see this pattern of systemic immune inhibition, and if that pattern looks familiar, it's the same pattern you see in cancer and in the placenta. These are nanots we've already made against these three key players, but we intend to make nanots against all of these soluble factors. 
So this is a key point. Senescent cells and tumors and the fetus must inhibit all cytotoxic immune factors in their microenvironment in order to survive. Immune evasion, though, can be curtailed if just some factors are removed. And here's a helpful analogy. If you want to destroy this enemy plane, you don't actually have to shoot every square inch of its surface. That would be overkill. A few well-placed shots will take care of the problem. So here's our pipeline. We're making nanots against four immune inhibitors for treating cancer, it's the, but they're the same immune inhibitors that are present protecting senescent cells. We're also producing uh, nanots, four of them, against inflammatory cytokines. These are involved in recognized autoimmune diseases. In combination, they could also be used to treat sepsis and their drivers of inflammation. We've already made nanots against mouse STNFRs and demonstrated excellent PD, PK, and efficacy. This is on our Gen 2 platform, which is ready to progress to human. So you can see that nanots can crash the target down to near zero within minutes and keep it down for, well, below 50% for about eight hours in this case. Now, that, that might not sound that long from a drug standpoint, but these targets have been, um, are inhibiting a profound cytotoxic cytokine. When you take the inhibitor out, you disinhibit the immune system, to, and it can deliver lethal hits against these aberrant cells. Looking at PK, which for in the nanot world is circulation time of the nanots, we've made seven nanots so far with very consistent circulation time. There's 30 to 40% of them left at the eight hour time point. And in general, they're functional nanots remaining out to about 16 hours. In the upper right are four nanots we made against STNFR1 and 2. This is for a first in human study that we're gonna announce next week with Mass General. And in the lower right are three nanots against soluble PDL1 which is for an active first-in-human collaboration we're doing with Mayo Clinic. So we made nanots against mouse STNFRs and tested them in a mouse model of triple negative breast cancer. This is a, a metastatic model, so you're looking for a delta of metastasis. Um, nanots blocked metastasis. They outperformed the main checkpoint inhibitor. This was as a monotherapy, though, with no other adjunctive treatments. And this was with 67% target depletion on the Gen 1 platform. We can now do 95% or better target depletion. We also followed up that study with gene expression analysis of immune and cancer cells from mice receiving nanots against STNFRs, which indicated an enhanced immune attack. And just briefly, um, because you're pulling out an inhibitor of TNF, you would expect to see gene expression indicating ligation of the TNF-R1 pathway on cancer cells, which is apoptotic. We did see that. TNF is also a chemokine. It attracts immune cells, so you would expect to see uh, T and NK cell infiltration, which we saw. We also saw downregulation of suppressive cell types. Overall, a strong uh, signal of immune attack in treatment groups. So nanots are a new way of clearing STNFRs, but there's dramatic clinical data that already exists on depletion of STNFRs via apheresis in humans with late-stage metastatic disease. So this is from a group called the International Immunology Foundation in Germany. Uh, they treat human patients by apheresis of STNFRs. They've treated over 100 patients uh, with representing more than 25 different solid tumor cancer types. This is a patient population where you would expect no improvement. They failed standard of care. Um, and the, in, the ORR that was documented using this method was 60%. That's the combination of complete response and um, partial response greater than 50% reduction. Conventional, actually, typical new investigation drug results, um, state of the art, you wouldn't see more than 10 to 20%. So this is a phenomenal result. Safety profile of nanots. Oops, let me go back a second. Sorry. Safety profile is excellent. We haven't seen any toxicity in multiple rodent studies, even dosing at 100 times what we plan to do in humans. We have a great IP uh, portfolio. We have 15 granted patents uh, covering a range of designs. These are our US patents, multiple designs, multiple targets and uh, multiple sources of those targets. We also have nine foreign counterparts, including four patents we got in the last few months. So uh, we have a wonderful team. Our CDO, COO, Curtis Ruge is here. He's a world-class drug discovery, drug design scientist with extensive immunotherapy and nano experience. And where are you? There you are, great. 
Uh, we also have a fantastic advisory board. I'm sure some of these faces are familiar to you. Um, one of our advisors, Anita Cosgrove, who's a very uh, experienced uh, healthcare executive, is here as well. Um, so we'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much. That's so cool. <laughs> That's really awesome, amazing. Even a very fast response, did you consider using it in acute sepsis? Because I see it's used in the ER. Sepsis is absolutely on our radar. Um, and there's three main um, molecules involved. There's, um, T there's TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta, and IL-6. And you have to take probably all three of them out. But all you have to really do, we think, to treat sepsis is extinguish those cytokines rapidly. That'll do two things. First, it'll stop the organ damage, which is what mainly kills people. And secondly, it will, um, secondly, it'll abrogate the auto-induction of those cytokines. So eventually, the immune cells will settle down. Yeah, it's very much on our, on our radar. More questions? Maybe. Okay. Some of those solubilized TNF receptors circulate at like very high levels and create like an antibody sink for our certain like monoclonal antibodies. Have you ever thought about pairing your technology with a standard monoclonal to actually get that antibody onto the cell surface while binding up all of the uh, circulating solubilized receptor at the same time? I don't think we want to try to recapture STNFRs and put them back on the surface. Um, we just want to take them out to take out the immune inhibition. Um, the cells still have plenty of membrane TNF receptors on their surface, so there should be no problem with TNF finding an open TNF receptor and delivering a death signal once the STNFRs are gone. So you showed the toxicity in rodents, that it's well tolerated in rodents. What about humans? Um, we haven't tested it yet in humans, but the materials are known to be safe because we're basically repurposing materials that have been used for drug delivery. We're just inverting the paradigm and using them to take targets out. And we're also only taking out targets that don't belong in the body in the first place. Mm. Okay. Any More other questions? questions? Uh, uh, there's one down here. Thank you very much for a brilliant talk. Uh, I'd like to ask, um, do you foresee any adverse effect of such therapy in humans? What kind of complications might be? I think you're going to see, so if you take out STNFRs, you're disinhibiting TNF systemically. And the place where TNF is most highly elevated is in the tumor microenvironment. So that's where you'll mainly see um, an effect. But there's a basal level of STNFRs, which is an inflammatory sink. We know it's not toxic to take out all inflammatory, to take out all STNFRs, because there's a genetic disorder where people can't make STNFRs. It's a chronic autoimmune condition. So I think the worst you're going to see is a transient autoimmune immune condition. And that predicate technology, people who are being treated by phoresis, they have uh, aches and pains that go away as soon as they're off treatment. So. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. That was really fantastic. Yeah.